I guess we'll get underway. Uh, appreciate all you folks uh, hanging around this long in the conference to uh, attend this. Uh, my name is Larry Zabielski. I'm a, a, a soil scientist uh, with the Texas Plant and Soil Lab in Edinburgh, Texas. Uh, pre previous, I, I spent 15 years doing research with the USDA Ag Research Service in, in in South Texas, in Westlaco, and and before that, I was uh, 18 years uh, uh, tenured professor at the University of Maine in Orono. So, uh, been looking at these kind of things for a long time, probably too long. But uh, that's just a little bit of my history. Um, uh, I trained as a soil microbiologist, and uh, happy to do that. And uh, very much related to that is our questions related to soil fertility and uh, just overall uh, growth and uh, uh, production of agricultural crops. So, so I'm pleased to talk this afternoon about um, uh, plant roots, uh, uh, a topic I hope by the end, end of this will we'll show you maybe a few things you hadn't thought about in terms of roots. Uh, they're re really strange creatures. You know, I, I almost consider those an independent creature from the green part. Isn't that weird? But because it, the, the metabolism in a root is very different than it is in the green portion of the plant. Uh, so it's worthy of emphasizing their role in all of this individually. So um, the idea here is to create a supportive environment in the soil around roots. Uh, we are absolutely convinced that, that doing so will make a huge difference in the productivity and the health of almost any plants you want to talk about, crop plants, ornamental plants, any, anything. That area around the root zone in the soil is extremely important. So uh, part of in increasing or uh, enhancing the, the conducive nature of, of that portion of the soil is, is what we're all about. And that, in the, when we're talking about soil properties, there's nothing more important than porosity. And, and uh, we'll get into this a little bit more detail, but porosity is extremely important in the exchange of gases to out of and into the soil, oxygen, carbon dioxide, why do we need oxygen in the soil? Uh, plants produce oxygen. Do they need oxygen in the soil? Plant roots need oxygen to do their own metabolism. So we have to be sure that we have an adequate amount of oxygen available to them. Aggregation, soil aggregation. Uh, the, and we'll have a lot more on that. But, but aggregation increases the percentage of large pores in the soil. So, so that makes it easier for water to move through the soil into and through the soil. It also makes it easier for gases to exchange. So aggregation is extraordinarily important. And general concepts related to soil tilth, you know, that, that's kind of one of those nebulous kind of of terms that uh, w we throw around. Everybody has probably a different definition of tilth, but it has to do with the suitability of the soil to support plant growth. And, and uh, a number of things influence that, biological, chemical, and as we talked about here, physical. Three kinds of roots in, in general. Uh, we have tap-rooted plants. We have fibrous type plants called gram, gram, from gr graminaceous type, grass type plants. And, and we have in some plants ad, ad, adventitious roots that we, we, we ascribe different kinds of activities for. Uh, the most obvious of, of all of these is, is the prop roots uh, that grow out of corn help actually prop it up. So, so uh, uh, they all function very much the same, but it, it's, it's the morphological differences that make 
uh, differences in, in, in how they grow or what they do, rather. All of them are, are responsible for the same kind of activity overall. And what are those functions? What are the f functions of the root? First of all, uh, the obvious one here is to keep the plant upright, you know, and, and that's more or as Im important probably as anything else because it keeps the leaves at the proper angle to intercept radiation from the sun. You know, it's that, well, okay, sure, but any trouble with that support system leads to trouble in the plants. Water uptake, yeah, what most people would just um, know automatically, it's almost intuitive, and that's real uh, commonly un understood as an important f function of the roots. And, oops, I went too far. Nutrient uptake. Uh, the other very obvious uh, kind of things. So what isn't so obvious is how all these things are related. And they really are in a number of ways. Okay, uh, roots perform the support function. All, all of us have, have seen roots growing in the soil, uh, hold, holding up plant, plants in the... Uh, I'm always amazed uh, at the ramifications of roots in a good, good soil, just tremendous. And that's uh, something to be promoted. And that's where the tilth idea uh, comes in. Uh, this photo on the left is, was uh, taken in some research plots I did a number of years ago. This is a, 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 a grass type plant called black oats. Uh, so uh, very good root system there. A graminaceous type roots very uh, 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 emanate from a crown and, and, and just take off in, into the soil. Whereas in dicots, in, in tap-rooted plants, we have a lot of secondary roots coming off the tap roots. But these things are all really doing the same things. There's just morphological differences between monocots and the dicots. So uh, we're holding plants upright. Um, roots also help hold or maintain the integrity of soil. And on an ecosystem level, this is extraordinarily important. Uh, it stabilizes terrestrial ecosystems by help, helping to hold a soil together. And, and uh, uh, without the soil, you don't have plants, obviously. So it's, a, it's a, 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 uh, what they call the ecosystem service function. Okay, let's look a little bit how what plants actually do here. Some nutrients, in terms of nu uh, nutrient uptake, some nutrients e enter the plant by the flow of water. These are called mass flow uh, ions. And, and it's kind of a passive thing. These things are in solution. A lot of the nitrogen enters a little like this uh, and some uh, calcium. Uh, they're... That they enter with the flow of water as the plant is drawing them up by making a, a, a hydraulic pressure difference between the top of the plant and the bottom. So there's an inflow of water there and the nutrients get uh, taken in, into uh, the root that way. So that kind of gives the idea that a root wor works like a straw, right? Uh, yeah, well, part of the time. It's uh, quite a bit more interesting even than that. So to get these nutrients to move to the roots, they need to be in solution. And, and the, the coral area of that is the root grows to the nutrient, mm -hmm. which is much less efficient than moving the nutrient in a waterfront into the root. But both of these things uh, happen. So how well the nutrients move from the roots, I mean from the soil into the root, is a function of porosity and water content. See, it all kind of begins to tie together. Soil and water. A very tight soil, a very high clay 
soil that's not structured properly will have a very difficult time moving in solution nutrients from the soil into the root. It just has to be that with too many obstacles for an easy flow. So what the characteristics of, a, of the soil around the root is makes a big difference. For instance, movement of ions to the root. Here's an illustration that I, I lifted off of, um, off of the internet from uh, the good folks at Yara uh, Industries. Look, look at that. Uh, phosphorus is the one that moves the least on its own, even in solution. So look at it. Uh, from the, the uh, horizon of the root, two to four millimeters is all you can ever hope to get by good movement of phosphorus to the root. Two to four millimeters is uh, a very small distance. And then the branches out from there, depending on the solubility uh, of the element, uh, uh, calcium, magnesium, a little bit easier to move. Uh, then um, uh, ammonium, potassium, so sodium, nitrate, sulfate, and chloride. The, the ones that are very highly soluble in water will move in that front readily. So the ones we have to be careful for, the phosphorus, calcium, and magnesium, it, 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 for sure, if we have a structural problem in the soil. So what, is the, uh, what are some of the characteristics of a good soil? to have around our, our uh, plant roots. Structure, the development of aggregation I mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, the composite idea of, of that is called structure in the so soil. Um, that has to do with drainage of free water and the movement of, of air in, into the soil and the waste gases out. Water holding capacity. Uh, how, how much water will the soil hold over time that will be available to the plants? That's a, a function of the texture of the soil, if it's a, a clay soil or sandy soil or something in between. And, and structure, how, how is it, is it uh, structured? Uh, pH moderate. Of course, we're always looking for chemical environment around that root that is conducive to keeping things in solution. As we do uh, get to extremes of pH, either acidic or basic, things begin to, to precipitate out of solution. So we have, have to be careful to do whatever we can to maintain that, that, that the soil around the root system, it, around neutral. Now, there are plants that have different requirements. Uh, blueberries, of course, very low pH uh, a requirement. They will not grow with it because they have almost uh, no ability to take up iron. So at low pHs, you're more likely to have higher iron concentration in solution. But that's another story. Cation exchange capacity is the ability of a soil to hold and release to plants. Uh, cationic nutrients, uh, ammonium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, uh, sodium, all of those are held on the soil and not allows them to wash through the soil. So they're available to equilibrate into the soil solution and be taken up in, into the plant. Uh, I like to see cation exchange capacities of 10 and higher. A sandy soil will have two or three uh, clay soil up to 25 or 30, sometimes even higher. But you have uh, other problems w w with these two extremes. A CEC around 10 it in implies a blending of soil particle types to get a, a good exchange of nutrients and yet have the capacity to drain and, and the capacity to hold m uh, moisture for the uh, plants. The last one is outlined in red here because I'm a firm believer in that. You, you, you cure a lot of these things and prevent problems if you maintain organic matter high enough in the soil around the root. There are a number of reasons for that, but uh, uh, the nutrients contained in them uh, is one e example. Uh, the biology 
contained in organic matter is the other. Uh, organic matter and m microbes are inseparable. They're absolutely inseparable. Anytime you have a soil that's high in organic matter, you've got microbial populations in good, good, good order, probably very good order. Okay, let's look a little bit at soil aggregation and what, uh, what that uh, contributes to the whole system. Technically, it's defined as a three-dimensional unit of soil particles, organic matter, microbes, and sometimes roots. Uh, these are held together by polysaccharides that are produced by microbes that are decomposing the organic matter. They always produce these kind of sticky polysaccharides that glue these individual soil particles together into a three-dimensional structure. And so what happens, it creates a new environment for specifically microbes because there's an inside and an outside. Let me show you a drawing of one here I've used many times. Uh, in here you, you can see um, soil particles clumped together with uh, fungal mycelia, bacterial colonies, and organic matter into a three-dimensional kind of a, of a clod-looking thing. They're normally very, very small, uh, two millimeters, three millimeters, at, four millimeters at the most, and those are not so stable. The ideal here is about from two to three millimeters in diameter. So they're pretty small. They said crumb structure. I'm, I'm sure all of you are very well aware of, uh, of what these are and, and, and what they look like. So uh, aggregation leads to better soil structure for the plant roots. The structure, again, remember that it changes the porosity in the soil to ensure that we have good drainage around the roots and a good aeration of the roots, a good exchange for oxygen to, uh, 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 to be supplied to the roots. The roots won't do much unless they have oxygen. Now, there are aquatic plants that have other mechanisms. Uh, and, and then other types of plants that have developed me mechanisms to handle this issue when they're underwater. Uh, patty rice spends a good deal of, of, of the time underwater to control the weeds and, and, and for other things. How does, it, how does it survive? Well, it has tissues called a rinkema that transport oxygen from the leaves down to the roots. So, so the roots are not doing without oxygen, even in a, uh, a patty rice plant. Um, so, uh, I, I, I guess I've already mentioned it produces bigger pore sp spaces to, to enhance all of this. And we look at this, uh, uh, this image uh, of, that, of everything we just talked about. And it, there's water around the roots in a good soil. And there's air to provide uh, m microbes and the plant roots oxygen. And, and uh, these are all in a three-dimensional uh, structure uh, around the, the, uh, the, the, the plant roots. Okay, soil and water in the roots, uh, how much of each is best? You know, the, we have some ballpark numbers on this that we normally go, go by. Uh, because soil and water occupy the same space, it's a zero-sum idea. They displace each other. As one goes up, the other goes down. So uh, uh, your plants cannot survive. The roots cannot survive. If, if the pores are constantly filled with water, and then vice versa, they can't. So, so, so there's a fractional difference be between the two that, that is uh, considered to be sort of optimal, but it jumps all over the place. Uh, normally, 70 to 80 percent of the total uh, of the porosity, if is occupied by water, 
in 30% or 20% occupied by air works out very well for most plants. This is probably a little bit more water than what most people like to keep or, or, or accustomed to keeping in their plant root environments. But you have to be very careful about overwatering, and, and we'll talk about that. Water holding capacity, the amount of water that the soil will hold when it's 100%, uh, all the pore spaces are filled up with water. So, and, and that's, and, and actually the higher that number is, the more likely you're, you're probably gonna have available water over a longer period of time. You just don't wanna leave it at 100% for very long. You need some of it to drain away, but then the, retain the rest of it, and that's a, a number that we call field capacity. And that allows air in and adequate amounts of water for the plant. Uh, so, uh, around 80%, as we mentioned, is, is, is what we normally shoot for, at least in the experimental purposes. Uh, that's the number that, that we're always after. What happens if we go higher than that? We can induce uh, a chronic anaerobic condition. Now, what happens there? Well, we, we've eliminated all the oxygens from the system. The plant has taken up all the oxygen it can, but uh, microbes have used all the oxygen available as well. So there's a, a real, a real uh, depletion of oxygen to the point where re things really begin to happen chemically and bi biologically. Uh, anaerobic microbes will take over in a situation like that and start, instead of breathing oxygen, there are m microbes in the soil that will breathe nitrate and turn it into a gas, and you've lost it. So you have, you have fertilizer nitrate in your so soil that's chronically flooded. You're going to lose a lot of it. And th these are natural processes, too, so we can't forget that. And this is, this in leaching is, is, is you know, the two major losses of nitrogen from around plant roots. Like uh, everybody estimates that, well, you, you need uh, X amount, uh, uh, say 100 units of not nitrogen uh, added to a crop, the plant only gets half that. Where's the rest of it? Gone by microbes. So you, even in a soil that we think is okay, very oxidative, that we call it, you're gonna lose quite a bit from denitrification that's the term that we use when m m microbes use uh, uh, nitrate to do respiration in, in place of oxygen. Or through leaching, if the soil is very grainy, very sandy, it, you lose a lot through leaching. But you, you lose approximately half. And this is in normal kinds of uh, conventional plant growing. Uh, there are many things we're able to do about that. But so some of the symptoms that arise are dark colors. And, 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 and I, uh, more than the color, I, I go by smell. Uh, there's a, a characteristic smell of an anaerobic soil. It's a sour kind of a smell. If it really gets bad and you start, the microbes begin breathing sulfate, they turn it into uh, hydrogen sulfide. And, and that's the rotten egg type smell. So in a really bad situation, you begin to smell a little bit of that. But depending on what's available for the microbes to eat, you, you can get a sweetish kind of a smell, like in a, and then a, a, an, an acid, like a vinegary type smell. These are all indications of chronic anaerobic conditions. Uh, metal ions can, can be reduced and then when the water goes away, oxidized again. So anytime you see what we call modeling, the, the formation of different colors in the subsoil, you, you know that you have a, a water table issue up, up to that point. Iron is a real giveaway there. <coughs> now I mentioned color was one of the uh, 
uh, of the outcomes, a change in co color. It's not normally so. This is uh, uh, soil without organic matter and soil with organic matter. I'm not talking about the darkening color that you normally get as organic matter and soil begins to increase. Or, or you add. It's a, a very d different type of, of an appearance. But like I said, more characteristically, it, it's the smell. Okay, what drives all this? Or let's talk about the plant, plant soil interface. Um, because this is where it's at. Uh, the interface of the root and the soil. It's actually an area now that's undergoing intense research in academic institutions and other places because we're seeing more and more that this is an extraordinarily important area to look at. Understanding this zone, I'm, I'm convinced, is, uh, is the key to successful agriculture. What happens here affects water uptake, nutrient uptake, susceptibility to root uh, pathogens, disease uh, problems, and largely determines how well the crop will do. And th this area right around the plant root is called the rhizosphere. I I'm sure all of you have uh, heard that term. It, it, it is the, uh, the soil zone immediately around plant roots that are impacted by the physiology of the root. So th this is a root function that has really begun to be, uh, come to the limelight, I, I, I think, of understanding how these, uh, how these systems work and really point out the importance of having good, healthy roots. This is a zone of intense microbial activity. Now, why is that? And that's because that plants produce root exudates. Root exudates are, are organic compounds that the root synthesizes up in the leaves and they move down through the plant into the roots and out of the roots. Why in the world would they do that? They, 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 these are high energy carbon compounds that the plant could use to grow more leaves or apples or carrots or whatever. But, but the, they're, they, they developed to, to push a part of that, that uh, photosynthetic carbon out the roots as organic acids and other types of um, uh, a, a few simple sugars on, 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 on to some peptides and other things. Yes, sir? When, when you said that the uh, microbes were digesting nitrates in the soil, what gas does that produce? Well, initially it produces nitrous oxide, N2O, and then a further reduction uh, produces N2, atmospheric kinds of nitrogen. So they just back to exactly, exactly. So, uh, so why do we get these root exudates in the soil? What? It's a sacrifice on part of plants, specifically roots. Why in the world would they do that unless they get something back? And uh, here's an illustration here. Here's a photomicrograph of, of um, some uh, organic acids that, that have been um, uh, highlighted. This is actually ultraviolet. And so you can see that all along that little, little route, that, that the, the uh, second one there, it has excreted these exudates out into the soil and, and they're beginning to influence the soil. And what's the n nature of these th things? This is a root tip, a uh, photomicrograph of a root tip. And, and normally, just according to their biology, roots will produce a gelatinous material right at the root tip that serves kind of as a lubricant to push through the soil as the root grows. And along the root right behind that are, are these real intense zones of root exudation. Uh, so uh, root tips lose cells and carbon rich exudates all, all the time, particularly at these growing tips. So the loss stimulates 
<laughs> microbes out in the soil because it's a lot easier to grow and decompose on these exudates than it is on organic matter. So certain microbes out in the soil, when a root goes by or are, are picking up the signals of, of, of these exudates and beginning to, to grow and pr reproduce uh, around that root. So why would a plant want all these microbes around the root? Well, we'll uh, talk about it. This is a photomicrograph a friend of mine took many, actually many years ago now, that shows this uh, gelatinous, oh, sorry, where did I go here? That gelatinous layer is the light green area there. It, uh, the technical term of this is mucigel that we call that. And then within that mucigel, all these little green spots, well, not, not all of them, but most of them are bacteria growing in there. They're micro colonies of bacteria. So they're just happy as clams grow, growing in there, see? And, um, and uh, here's the, uh, the surface of the root, and here's the cortex of the root over here to give you a little geography there. So they, they grow happily uh, in this root zone. So another function of the root is to establish this kind of relationship with soil microbes. What do these microbes do? Many of them are pro actually produce plant growth regulators. And we call them PGPR, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. Uh, and, and there are several kinds of these. They produce uh, carrier molecules to excrete out in, into the soil medium to carry iron into the soil trace elements and to enhance the rate of organic matter decomposition around the root to bring in nutrients. They provide a channeling effect to, to help bring in nutrients, especially phosphorus. Remember we said that phosphorus migrates very little on its own, but in an enhanced situation like this, they can migrate pretty well. So enhancement of nutrient uptake is very important part of what root microbes are doing. And the ability of the root, how well the root is able to do that is an important function that is often, I think, overlooked. They produce many, many, many compounds that, that, um, that help the plant directly and in, indirectly. They participate in the control of nutrient absorption into the root. They provide direct and indirect plant protection. This, uh, by direct protection, I, I mean a lot of these will produce different kinds of antibiotics to resist invasion of the roots by pathogenic fungi in particular, but also pathogenic bacteria. So uh, competitive exclusion idea is, is an ecological idea that if, uh, some, if some organism is already occupying what we call a niche in the environment. It's, very, it's usually very difficult for, to mm -hmm. displace that population. If, and if this is a neutral or a promotive population, a pathogenic population has a hard time getting those out and replacing them around the root. <coughs> One really really interesting thing. I've, I have always thought, I, I, I couldn't believe it the first time I read this. There was a, a, even a higher order of communication between microbes, the roots, and the environment that's been demonstrated. And uh, this has to do with the uh, presence of a contaminant in the environment that the m microbes have a hard time decomposing. What microbes do we have there? The ones that respond to particular exudates from this plant. So what happens, there's some chemical signaling back to the plant to change what the plant is producing as an exudate and pushing that out into the roots that stimulates another population of soils that can process that contaminant. 
uh, th this has been shown. To, to me, that's just astounding. So there's signaling, chemical signaling between the soil, the microbes, and the plants all the time. And it's all moderated right at the level of the plant root. Like extraordinarily important idea. So how do we, how, how do we enhance this? How do we do it on time? Yeah, okay. Uh, the best way, you know, we, we can th think about in engineering plants that produce particular exudates. I, yeah, I, I'm not a particular fan of those kind of approaches. But the, the idea is to look at the soil very closely and fix what's wrong in your soil to make it a more conducive place for uh, plant roots. And, and again, the best way to do that without devoting yourself to matching nutrient needs and this and that for between plants and microbes is, is to make sure you maintain a, a good amount of organic matter. In that, now we're talking about the root zone. Uh, so that really helps. Uh, if there is a physical problem in the soil having to do with compaction, that has to do with the, uh, the inability to drain the soil, the inability to get oxygen into the so soil. All of these are very detrimental to uh, uh, a, a, a conducive plant root environment. Not obviously, anybody that has tried to, to grow, grow things on a compacted soil will, will identify with that, I, I, I think. And these are the reasons. You just can't get penetration of roots, it's just uh, like growing through concrete. So if you've got a problem like that, a physical problem, it needs to be remedied b before uh, you uh, do too much else. Extremes of pH, these are usually relatively easy to, re to repair. If your soil is extremely acidic, you're going to have n n nutrient problems in terms of phosphorus and, and iron, in, in, in particular zinc. Uh, a bit, uh, they, they get tied up as aluminum and iron phosphates at very low pH. Very insoluble, and in, uh, you'll never get those into your roots. But again, there are plants that require very low uh, or acidic environments. But in general, if we're sh shooting for a pH a little bit less than neutral for m most plants. So that can be fixed, and that helps, contributes to a conducive plant root environment. Nutrients out of balance. Uh, we see this at Texas Plant and Soil Lab all the time. Uh, just a soil that has been overformed and hasn't been taken care of in terms of keeping the nutrients in there that the plants require. Uh, we see this all the time, and that does not create a healthy root environment. You got a soil very deficient in phosphorus. Uh, the plant roots are going to have a hard time growing and pro proliferating, ramifying through the soil if they don't have enough uh, phosphorus. Just as uh, an example, okay, if all those things are taken care of, what about adding microbes? I, I, uh, uh, we at the lab get this question all of the time, and, and uh, there are lots of products out there that a person could use to add microbes. Why would you want to add m microbes? Well, microbes are good, so, so why not add some more? Which ones do I add? Okay, see, and now we're getting a little stuck. Sticky, you know, which ones do we want, want to add? When do we want to add them? Let's see, uh, this is all along the idea of improving the plant root environment. How do we apply them? And where do we apply them? Uh, there's some places and times that make it almost impossible to add m m m microbes. Some of the microbes in terms of which ones to add, some with a good rep, repu, reputation, <clears throat> and these are available in the bugs in the jug type I, I, idea. I don't mean to diminish that, that idea just as a recognition factor. Uh, people ought to talk about these. Uh, Bacillus pseudomonas streptomyces, trichoderma is a fungus that, that has a real good reputation uh, and then, of course, the mycorrhizal fungi, both 
endo, which is the type that colonizes uh, uh, grass type uh, plants and to a degree dicots. But uh, <clears throat> ec uh, 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 ectomycorrhiza for, for trees and larger tree like uh, shrubs. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so adding m microbes, fixing all these uh, other issues. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, bottom line is if we don't fix the soil, we will have habitat problems. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so the idea is to place m microbes as close to the plant roots as you can it, <clears throat> if we're talking about uh, existing plants. Uh, there are other opportunities if we're growing brand new little plants, but placing them on the seeds, on the roots directly, if that's possible, or around the seeds is the b best idea. And then also to use them uh, with supporting, thank you, Mirtha, thank you. <laughs> I'll just hold it. <laughs> Adding these with supportive treatments, um, um, molasses and humates and things, adding just microbes to the soil. Uh, oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm not used to this kind of treatment. <laughs> <coughs> adding um, microbes directly to the soil is, is a little bit hazardous because they're already many more microbes in the soil, in, in a normal soil, than the ones you're adding. So you've got to give them some help. The idea is to establish them. Establish them as inhabitants around the roots. So they normally need, or we always recommend adding those with these supportive treatments, um, molasses and humates and things like that. The molasses for uh, for a number of reasons, it's an osmotic protectant and it, it provides a little bit of energy. Uh, humates because they're a bu buffer, a biological and chemical buffer to help so all these toxins produced by other m microbes. It, it, it key, kind of keeps them away from our inoculated populations. Products, you, you know, I, I decided to go ahead and add this portion into this talk, even though it's not directly related. But if we're talking about creating a conducive rhizosphere, uh, these are the kind of products you may consider using. And, and I break these down into a number of categories. It makes it easier to think about these. These are not, number one is biologicals. These are living or dormant microbes that you can buy. That's the bugs in the jug. Uh, so you, those are available in, uh, with containing bacteria, fungi, and combinations of those. And they're almost always provided with some kind of a carrier in there, hum, either humic acid or humate, uh, uh, something like that. They're di designed, obviously, to add or reestablish a vital function uh, crop nutrient acquisition, crop, crop protection, a, a vital function to help the root carry out. <clears throat> the label usually has microorganisms that are present in the bottle, and even the populations, you know, I'm, I'm always tickled by the numbers they write on there, 10 million of, of these microbes in and in, in a gram of soil, you, you normally have a hundred million mi microbes already there. <laughs> so it's, it's always kind of curious to me but that, that they include the numbers, but that I guess it works, I don't know, to sell it. Okay, biologicals. Uh, others were actual m organisms. Uh, um, now, under biological number two, we have st stimulators and activators, and there's a truckload of these out there. And what they're designed to do are the, uh, usually extracts of composts or manures that have been modified biologically. Sometimes they, people add organisms to that or other types of things. Uh, trace element uh, is a very 
common addition to these uh, trace elements, iron, zinc, copper, manganese, uh, uh, to these. They're designed to pr promote the growth of existing microbes. It's either stimulating the existing microbes you have to do these kind of root colonization activities that we're after. So that, that's kind of the theory behind uh, soil activators and, and uh, stimulators. A bunch of those out there. And they may also supply needed micronutrients, as we mentioned. Primarily, it's probably coming from the humates that, that they add. They also often claim to stimulate plant growth promoting bacteria. And that the idea there is that they stimulate just the microbes in the soil that are going to benefit the plant root. And I don't know how they do that, honestly. But, uh, but nonetheless, I don't mean to disparage any, any particular pr product, but I guess I'm just a little too picky. Okay, and so now let's look at derived products. These uh, are coming from things that were at one time alive and, 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 were, uh, and were deriving some things from it. The first one, of course, is uh, uh, composts. Uh, compost are a source of nutrients, microbes, organic matter, including humus. Um, uh, humus is a, a separate talk altogether, but uh, we won't be doing that today. The, uh, uh, the important thing here, I, I, I hope you, you'll consider, is that there's a great range of quality in compost. Compost is just not compost. You know, most of what I think people who describe their compost to me and the uses of it is not what we call a cured compost. It's a probably half to three quarters stabilized. So there's a good fraction of the organic carbon in the compost that is still very active. And that could be good or bad, uh, depending on its application and use and timing and everything. But, but the quality, I just want to make the point that the quality can vary tremendously. The source materials, you can choose a compost made from different source materials, feed stocks that they call that, because it affects the final uh, characteristic. Uh, you want a fungal compost, make sure you, uh, you use feed, feed st uh, stocks that promote fungal growth very high carbon to nitrogen ratio material, brown paper bags and uh, cotton seed hulls, uh, things like that, rice hulls, very good straw. These are very good at stimulating a lot of fungal growth. And from that, uh, uh, th then as you add that, that kind of carries over into the s soil. We always talk about rhizosphere microbes in terms of bacteria, but there are fungi there too that contribute to the health of, of the plant. Just most of what we understand is bacterial. And you can create a bacterial compost by using highly, a, a lot of greens and uh, carrying out your compost under that condition. Another derived product is a compost tea. Uh, th these are ec extracts either brewed or extracted uh, from compost, and they're also a source of microbes, nutrients, plant protectors, micronutrients, biological buffers, and chemical buffers. Uh, all these things contribute together in a, 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 a holistic way to the health of plant roots because of what they do to the microbes around, around the roots. Uh, another derived product is humate. Uh, humate is, is more like, it's a mined product, a mined material, but it was originally from plant material. They've been buried long ago. It, it's, it's sort of like the buried plant material that, that moves towards oil and coal, especially coal. But it's not that old. It's not old enough to be coal. <laughs> So it's mined, there's a, a good portion of it that is soluble in water, a lot of high molecular weight, long chain organic molecules 
come into solution whenever you add humate, and humate is in water. <coughs> um, similar to coal. Three main components of humate uh, then are humic acid, fulvic acid, and human. We won't go into much of that, but the first two are the most important in terms of solubility in the, uh, in, in the root zone. Uh, and these are actually used on as, as uh, 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 amendments to the leaves as well. Very different materials. Uh, they are the source of some micronutrients, buffers, chelators, and plant protectants. So uh, those are how I kind of separate um, microbes, all these biological products. And, and evaluation of, of those kind of depends on what class th that they're in. Combinations of them are often used as well. All of this, again, to increase the conducive n n nature around that plant root. Uh, deciding on, on products. Do I need biologicals or bottled ones better? <clears throat> so question you need to ask yourself, do I have reason to believe that m microbes are not there? If I plant my corn seed in this little place here, do I have reason to believe that microbes are not present around there? You know, it's possible. It's not probable, but are you convinced? And this I'm not telling you yes or no. You just have to make a decision. Uh, or is there reason to believe that my, my microbes are not in my soil? Uh, am I working with an abused or wrecked soil that's uh, turned into dirt? Now, that's the difference between soil and dirt. Is is that it's uh, soil is not being overused, abused, and not taken care of. There is. Has there been a contamination event in the past? Uh, we work with, uh, uh, or, or I've worked with the, in the past, uh, uh, p people charged with remediating uh, oil drilling platform locations, and those soils are just awful because they bring in anything to p put around that drilling pad pack it down to where uh, trucks can drive on it, and then it's contaminated with crude oil occasionally here and there and solvents that, that, that they use in the drilling industry. It's just awful stuff. But yet now laws are on the books that those places have to be remediated once they give them up or cap them, as it's called. So there's a good place where you might think that, well, we need to go full bore on remediation of this using m microbes and all these derived products. And that's, that's perfectly justifiable. Uh, do we have any newly exposed soil? Are we leveling the soil? You bring up some subsoil. Normally, uh, when, when they do that, they do that often in the Rio Grande Valley and other places uh, too. And, and that can result in some very problematic conditions to grow plants for a few years and, and, and until things can begin to happen. Microbes can repopulate the area. We can start building up organic matter and whatnot. But, but all, all these, you see what I'm, I'm, I'm driving at here. Is there a reason for you to believe that mi microbes are not present in your soil? Deciding on products, so uh, what should I use? M microbes, derived products, uh, th these are all good questions. I if I'm going to use microbes, is my soil in good enough condition to accept and protect those microbes? Do I need biologicals right now? I is it such that my plants are growing so quick? That, uh, that they grow roots quick enough to get attacked by these microbes. The damping off is a prime example of, of a condition that will respond to added biologicals. Which ones should I buy? Well, we've already talked about that in general, but, but what kind of problems am I trying to address here in the root zone? Do I need plant protectants? either for the leaves or the roots? Or do I need something that'll help me with nutrient transformations? 
you know, there are products marketed for each of these. Uh, a streptomyces gluticus crate insect control microbe. It doesn't do a thing for nutrient transformations, but it's a great microbe to, to control uh, fungi and, and some insects on the green part. So, uh, and nutrient transformation, of course, is a question related to the soil. So, establishing in a supportive environment around that root to ensure that we have a healthy place for root to grow becomes paramount. So, as, as a review now, improving and maintaining structure in your soil in general is an important place to, to begin. The balance your nutrient management plan such that uh, you'll give the plants a better chance of having what they need when they need it, especially early on. We've decided at our lab that this, this emerging plant uh, from seed to emergence, that is a very critical time to make sure that we're taking care of. The roots are growing, top is growing, just have to, it, very important to take care of those at, at that particular point. And doing what, what you need to do to ma maintain a balance between air and water in the pore spaces of, of the roots. Maintain a high proportion of large aggregates, those aggregates larger than two millimeters. That, that ensures good drainage, good aeration of the soil. Because these things re relate to good soil management. So doing, practicing good soil management uh, uh, certainly contributes greatly to, to good, healthy roots. And they'll be able to carry out all their f functions. Uh, it, uh, good soil management encourages both plant and microbial diversity. That's where a good mixture of organic amendments to the soil ensures that you have lots of different microbes in the soil for the plant root to choose from. You see, that's what's going on there. Plant root comes along and by the chemical nature of its exudates, it chooses microbes from the palette of microbes out there to grow in its own rhizosphere. So, you know, these things have developed together, roots and microbes, for millennia, longer than that. So, you know, the plant kind of knows what it wants to do. Uh, we just have to, have to take care of that. So the bottom line is you get to know your soil. And uh, that's not really a picture of me, but it could have been <laughs> at some point. You just get to know your soil, the limitations and the potentials, because that really works to create this um, healthy plant root environment that will result in the kind of crop productivity that we're all after. Thank you. Thank you. I guess we have a little. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That way you can do the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any uh, uh, questions or comments? Yes, sir. Right, are you going to make your slides available? I, I would, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. Available this whole thing oh, that, that's right, you're video taping it, so, so that's available too. Okay, good. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, I heard some talk about um, anaerobic soil digestion or solarizing the soil or different ways to help fight soil diseases. What are your thoughts about those in terms of how it interacts with microbes? Organization, uh, for sure. That's that's the idea of putting a like a plastic sheet on the soil and allowing the greenhouse effect to really heat up the soil and to kill pathogens. I know a lot of strawberry growers will use that to reduce the amount of pythium and everything else in there, and that works. Uh, the regular soil microbes. Uh, really don't have too much problem with that because most of them are a little deeper than that. But some of those pathogens are deeper than that too. So solarization will 
will knock the populations of pathogens down, but it sure won't eliminate them. It just, it just helps. A far better idea is to, in, in, in my view, is to create that, that protective environment in the soil where you're going to uh, put your vegetable slips or, or, or strawberry plants. I don't know what you're growing, but, but uh, to, to make sure we've got that properly uh, changed to support uh, healthy roots. Healthy roots can do a lot to resist these kind of pathogens. We, we have any number of explanations or, or examples uh, of that, that, that we've gotten rid of root pathogens by, by using biological amendments and proper nutrition. And uh, the example I'm thinking of in sugar beets, rhizoctonia disease in sugar beets is a big deal. And one of our clients has eliminated that problem by using microbial amendments and by properly fertilizing the plants. And, and the other one, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Anaerobic soil digestion. I'm not familiar with that. I, I think I can understand what yeah. they're talking about. They it was basically like, um, like taking like hay or something and, or straw and laying, laying it on top of your soil and then taking like plastic you would use in plastic culture, mm -hmm. wrapping it up mm -hmm. and it's filling it full of water and just kind of letting it digest and work itself out for a while. Okay. Just, I mean, you talked for a little bit about how anaerobics, like compacted mm -hmm. anaerobic soil changes the way microbes are. Like how do you think that would affect well, I, I think it, it, it should work okay, depending on how the soil is handled after you remove that and you want to plant into it. I, I had not actually heard that. That's a, an interesting idea. What's happening there, of course, is that's not really a heat treatment. They're encouraging the decomposition of this high amount of organic matter using up oxygen uh, because it's not diffusing through this uh, tunnel plastic or whatever you use. So it creates an anaerobic environment and gets rid of a lot of microbes. The other mechanism I could easily imagine there are some of these fermentation products from the decomposition of this straw or whatever it is, filtering down through the soil and, and, and really uh, detrimentally affecting all populations, but including the pathogen population. So I, I, I guess that, that, that's a really interesting concept to me. It's a new one. Uh, to me, but I can understand how it might work. How would you suggest following it? Oh, for sure. Uh, after you remove that stuff to uh, uh, aerate the soil again. And now give it time, because some of these fermentation products are very volatile, like uh, uh, sulfide in, in the acetates, uh, these organic uh, uh, products of fermentation. You got to let those be e either uh, given off by the soil or used again by the m microbes repopulating that th they can actually use these things as energy sources and break them. Now th this is re really the curing idea that we use uh, a c concept in the compost production. You let all these microbial things happen and then when it's not heating anymore we push it over into another place to leave it alone for a number of months to allow the repopulating microbes to destroy all these uh, plant growth inhibitors that are produced anaerobically. So, so that, I think, is the idea of what's going on with that, but I'm not sure because it's a new idea to me. When they do that, they're setting up a fermentation, a biological ferment. Yes. And then they ferment that product to get it into a certain level and it becomes microbial activity and that fermentation process. It's kind of like making way, and then I think they're going to use that once they get that going. Then other things are going to take off on it better because they use it as a fermentation process. It's kind of like if you put apple cider vinegar down with your seeds, it's going to stimulate the biology in the soil to come up and hook up to those seeds. But the apple cider vinegar is a fermented process, right? To get that. Mm -hmm. So when, what they're doing is they're doing it directly on the soil, yeah. taking the fermentation process, and rather than putting it on the seeds and throwing the seeds down, they're putting the fermentation yeah. process right on the soil. So it has to be managed pretty well because you can screw it up in a bunch of ways. We can try to screw it up. You can screw it up really easy because you can, you can cook it, you can do some things. It's just like making wine. 
you can screw up wine really easy and end up with vinegar. And what they're doing on that process is they're doing that. They're trying to get a, a type of fermentation that goes to a certain level and creates a certain uh, level of uh, microbial activity. But if you go over, you screw it up. You know, I mean, you can really screw it up pretty much. Yeah. And so it's, it's a balancing act that works much trigger. Well, in the, if but if you allow enough time for that to recover on its own, it, it can get rid of all the uh, time cures everything. <laughs> yes, sir. I've done a lot of the solarization. I've also done a lot of digging weeds out by hand, and I use the solarization to kill the perennial quack grass and stuff like that. And uh, I would have to say that I've not been able to observe any difference when you go to plant it after you're done. In either case, a difference in how the plants grow. So it would appear that the microbes, there's not much harm to them. Many of them are going to go into dormancy. Yeah, there are mi microbes that can resist an enormous amount of heat. The, the, they can go dormant and form what we call endospores. Uh, the bacillus uh, th that I had on the list there is really good at that. It, it'll resist b boiling water. So, so yeah, your point's well taken there, that uh, you haven't seen anything in, in reduced soil performance after solarization. The plants seem to grow just as well. To my eye, as an engineer, I'm experienced observing differences. But I really can't see any differences. Yeah. And, and that's the general consensus, I think. Uh, that they use that technique extensively in Florida and strawberry f fields to, uh, to uh, get rid of some of the problems. They have tremendous problems in strawberries. Those of you who grow strawberries know, know that everything eats strawberries. They're, just, they're, a, they're a wimpy little old plant. And it avoids the heavy work of trying to dig them out by hand, all the weeds, or using glyphosate problems, or... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the tillage problems. Yep, I, I can certainly see that. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, digging weeds, I'm way too old for that. Yeah. Yes, sir. I want to figure out what bacteria are in my soil. Is there a place I can go and get a test done? Uh, a particular identification? Yeah, or I have pseudomonas or? Yeah, there are some little labs around that will do that. Uh, uh, for you, if you really want to know that, uh, my now that's another whole area of my pe peeves. But uh, in that, that's worthy of another hour-long discussion. But uh, there are places that will identify the microbes that that you have. Yes, sir. When a plant, when you get a something that has a lot of salt buildup due to synthetic fertilizer and stuff, does that have a tendency to break down microbial activity or not so much microbial activity I, I haven't seen a salinity level high enough in the soil to really affect microbes plants or another matter of course they're very some of them are very susceptible to osmotic pro problems and transport problems uh, if the salt in the soil is too high but not for microbes. It just doesn't get that high. Uh, microbes grow in ocean water, seawater, 35,000 uh, parts per million so salinity. Uh, we don't normally see that high of salinity in agricultural soils. We never see that high of salinity. So I, 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 is that answering your question? Yeah, I was looking at a turf situation where a lot of people use a lot of stuff in those areas yeah. and if you were solarizing grass areas and stuff you still have a lot of salts in there yeah. for the build up over years and years of sure and, and for plant purposes uh, the best two things you can do uh, to eliminate that uh, with salt the best thing all around is leaching leach the salts out but if you add uh, some uh, humate material it'll be a co-transport ion and it'll move it'll help move is it a sodium problem yeah fertilizer salts would be a, most likely a sodium and a chloride problem this would help protect the roots you have there and then move the rest of it out you may yeah elcho 
um, and deal with potato soils that are <clears throat> high in pH, like over 8, um, 80 plus percent calcium, below 2 percent potassium, but when you do a mining analysis, you still got several thousand pounds of potash. And the fertilizer potash that was applied in the spring runs out by the third week of August. Uh, foliar is an option, but how can I tap into those thousands of pounds? Or is it just locked up so tight in no. the crystal structure? Probably not. Uh, how's the phosphorus in, in that s system? You mentioned uh, potassium. Yeah. Uh, it, it, so that's the real problem is how to unlock the potassium. Uh, a certification with the elemental sulfur would really do it. Uh, it'll also release an enormous amount of that uh, calcium too. So uh, if you can get your hands on uh, elemental sulfur, we recommend that all the time for high pH soils. It's good for phosphorus, sulfur, potassium release. It, it, it really helps to bring that pH down a unit anyway from eight. It's over eight, you said? Yeah, there's no exchange sites left to hold any potassium, so we're not building beyond that 1.8 that it might be. That's a tough condition, yeah. Probably the best thing to do is to, is to stimulate a chemical de decomposition of all those uh, carbonates and phosphates. And no special bug in the <laughs> well, we'll we, do that for me. Yeah? Well, we, we were talking with a fellow t today about some of those ideas, and they're experimental at best. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no special bug that I know of. Yes, ma'am. I have one more question. Um, we have a lot of damping off in our greenhouse with our transplants, and you mentioned that bacteria can help with damping off. Is there a, a role for bacteria or a way to get bacteria into greenhouses? transplants and kind of protect them at that stage? Sure. A lot of these products that we talked about, the biologicals, the microbe biologicals, uh, are really used to the best effect by in inoculating uh, the little plugs in your transplant trays. And, and from the instant you get your germination of, 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 uh, of the plant, are you using cuttings or are you growing from seed? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, then the, you, you're exposing all of those roots coming out to those added microbes, and you'll get that protective effect. So the versilium can't really easily make a home there. And it doesn't hurt to, to spray them over the top, too, to prevent the spores from forming on the edges and things. So yes, uh, using it in the greenhouse during the development, to me, is the best way of getting your transplants in a good condition to go into the soil. You have good healthy roots, healthier roots any, anyway, to uh, endure the harsh conditions in the soil. I, I really support that idea. Any, any other questions? Okay, I guess we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. My son works for Gold North, and he, they've got these ponds where it's just finely ground rock with no nutrients in it. And they want to start, they want to get covered with something. Oh, yeah. No, I sent them humates, molasses, uh, and liquid calcium, calcium nitrate. Okay. Now, I was just, when I heard you talking, I was thinking of biologicals, but there's nothing there for them to grow on. Exactly. So there's no organic matter in, no. in that. So they're, they're going to need. Uh, the easiest way to ensure that you have things in there for to take care of microbes to do all these other things is to add something like a, a compost or <coughs> compost extracts or something like that. So when, the, when the paper mill was nearby, mm. they were dumping the paper waste on, and that got them started. Now, the other thing I suggest okay. is find weeds locally and spread the seeds on, they might be the m most likely to, to grow. <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, if the object is to just get something growing on yeah, it, then, then the, uh, yeah, native plant uh, species from that area probably would be as good as anything. Because once they get something growing, get some organic matter there, then they can 
move from there. Right? Yes, sir. That's a long process, but it, it can be done. Because he planted the rye and hardly got any oh, yeah. much, much there. Yeah, rye grass is pretty finicky. Rye grass and not cereal rye. Right. It was cereal rye that he Oh, it was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's just about as bad, yeah. Okay. Uh, those um, cultivated uh, uh, plants, uh, sometimes in a situation like that, don't do nearly as well as the native weeds. So that, that would be a good idea. At some point in the future, those would have to be managed, I guess. But, but uh, to get something growing on it, to hold it all together and start improving that native fertility, that, that sounds pretty good to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Last question before you you should. Oh, let me get off this platform. I don't know how to turn this thing off. Where's the button? Maybe people will come. Don't turn it off. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. My name is Boris Boincian. I am from the Republic of Moldova. It's oh. a small country between Romania. Oh, and I know where Ukraine. it is. I've been there. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Have you been in Moldova? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, to the, oh uh, it was long probably time ago. eight, eight or nine years ago. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, it was as a tourist or what? Well, no. It, on on a, a trip from U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh -huh. we went to Odessa and then down to uh, Moldova. Mm -hmm. um, Have you been in Chisinau or in other places also in Moldova? Uh, is the capital of Moldova. No, we were just kind of on the edge. Um, is, is there a, um, where's the Grape Institute? Did, did a grape? Ah, yes. Yeah. Um, Vineyards. It's yes. one of the oldest institutes in the uh, yes. yeah, even for is, the Soviet Union. Yeah, because the first one is in Crimea. Mm -hmm. uh, so is, is the other one in the Ukraine? Is yes. that the bottom of Ukraine? Okay. Yeah, all right. The first one, is the oldest, is in Ukraine, and the second is in Moldova. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm working in the long-term field experiments uh, with different field crops, in permanent crops, monoculture, and in crop rotation, and also in the long-term field experiments with different system of fertilization. And what you found, I'll tell you two conclusions, and I don't have a good explanation of this. First, the fertilizers, mineral fertilizers, are the most effective, in other words, the extra yields from fertilization is significantly higher in monoculture than in crop rotation. <laughs> so this is one question which uh, is bothering me, and I think that the explanation should be the root health, because the roots began to decay when we are harvesting, and before harvesting, the roots, you can destroy them in, in mm. monoculture. But in crop rotation, they are nice, excellent. You can't destroy them. Mm -hmm. The capacity to absorb water and nutrients is excellent. Mm -hmm. So the conclusion is the higher is the biodiversity of crops, the better is the health of soils, and the better is the ability to take nutrients and water. So for this, more or less, if, and why I'm asking you, maybe you found in the literature something about this, I would be very interested to know more about this. This is one conclusion. And the other, which I can't answer, uh, definitely I can suppose, but I can't answer. Mm -hmm. So we found in the long-term field ex experiment with different um, rates of phosphorum that the yields, for example, of corn, the high yields of corn is when rates of mineral fertilizers, fossils, are the lowest. And vice versa, the higher are the rates of phosphorus, the low are the yields of corn. And I suppose, but I don't know, I suppose that the explanation is mycorrhiza, that mineral fertilizers, phosphor fertilizers, are suppressing uh, the development of mycorrhiza. I'm, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Well, that's a, a possibility, uh, for sure, the, the most direct one. And, uh, uh, that can be determined, you know, by m microscopically looking at the roots. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, but um, high phosphorus fertilizers uh, are known suppress, to, suppress. to suppress um, mycorrhizal infection into the roots. So, uh, Do you know, say, data from the literature? Oh gosh, there's a lot of uh, the Canadians have produced a lot of that information. Um, 
I would appreciate if you can help me in this direction to send me maybe some. Yeah, do you, my, my, uh, okay. Yeah, here's my email address. Already? Uh, yeah, I, I, I will. I would appreciate if you. And I don't know if it's not a secret. Unfortunately, I have to get out from, from no, here okay. because somebody sure. called me. But I would be very interested to have your presentation, uh, but if it's not a secret. <laughs> no, it's not it's secret. Not no, a secret. no yeah. not at all. So yeah. I, I can arrange that. Yes. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very well, welcome. I appreciate you your much. question. It was my pleasure. Yeah, my, very, very interesting. Very interesting Thank statement. you very much. Thank you. You're very kind. All the best. All Thank the you. Best. I'm sorry I didn't ask you earlier. Um, but uh, I'm a rank amateur, my wife and I. And we have raised beds. And they're about two and a half feet tall. And so I'm, I'm not, I grew up on a farm, so, you know, I know about tilling and all that stuff, but we aren't really tilling, mm -hmm. but, I mean, but everybody tells us we, sh we can't, you know, dig into the soil very far, so I'm not 100% sure how we know about our, our root problem, if we have root yeah. problems or not. I, I know that sounds really crazy, but... No, um, no, not, not, not at all. So, you, uh, you're... Your crops have not done very well. Is, well, is uh, no, we, we've done okay. We well, we're in Colorado Springs, so nobody told us about the soil because I grew up in Iowa. So you know, oh, you put it, oh, you put yeah. it in, it goes up. You know, and deep soils. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we like, you know, we put it in. We put it in, and nothing came up. Of course, and then huh. my we've wife had trial here. By fire. So, so <laughs> oh, wow. last about about two months ago, we discovered decided to cover our beds with. Plastic, uh, plastic. plastic, and now we've got some good stuff going on, but I just, we just sort of don't know enough to know about if, you know, we know about, when you were talking about this, the the root stuff, I really can't, I mean, I don't, about aerating it, yeah, if how there do are you things that we can do killing? or we can't do. Don't, you, uh, the best way is to make sure you, you've added the materials that will allow aggregation to form. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, so get the uh, minerals right, and then everything. Yes, else. yeah. The no-till people have have questions about that uh, too, too. But the, uh, it, it it boils back down to organic matter to me. So the uh, the more organic matter in in there, the more aggregation you'll get, and the b better aeration you'll have. Because that soil web is already yeah. like the worms so and composted. stuff that are creating the holes in the soil. Sure, yeah, that, that's another part of aeration that, that in a, a, a highly organic system, a lot of earthworm activities uh, is, is present. Earth, earthworms are there. So, the, so we, we, we've been using compost to do that. Mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you're on the right track. I guess I, I don't know why you would not have had um, something come up in that system immediately and you know that but b b b because you put good soil into it yeah but or it was it, i don't i think the top soil we used was not there was not enough organic matter oh really well that well the, i mean and this is the, colorado you know the water evaporates like all the time well mm -hmm. he lives in texas i oh, then assume you know. he knows that mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. my, Garden my sister the, lives in yeah, Texas, so I don't know. Yeah, growing in the extremes. Yeah. But yeah, but, yeah. Well, the, it was, the odd thing was is that we, we planted, and then Colorado Springs had the high, highest rain they've but ever had July, in July, and it washed out. And then so yeah. then we replanted, and then it, it came, and it came up. But then now some of the stuff we planted earlier is coming up too. <laughs> Okay. I don't know why. Well, no, I mean, yeah. because the seeds stood, stayed in that seed yeah. bed. Yeah, and they may have been moved down a little bit, and they ended up being planted too deep or something. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah, yeah like I said, we'll, we'll, it's all we need to make mistakes. We just like some answers. <laughs> the best teachers, Most of us don't try. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank, Thank you. You, you Thank have a good you day. Now. and Great talk. Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. Do you have any uh, dinner plans, Jason and I, when... Oh, I, I think we're, yeah, we're, we're uh, scheduled to, to, to do something United as our group. I, okay. I don't know what, but I yeah, appreciate that. Okay. And then uh, I'll grab a bite to eat. Okay. Come back tonight for the, the last speaker. Oh, the, uh, yeah, the last one. Okay, Elcho. Good. Yeah. Good to Good see you. Good to see you, fellow. Yep. Thank you very much. I'm going to figure out how to turn this off. <laughs>